Today we're convening a support site seminar in Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. The purpose for our seminars is to stay connected to the people whom we're trying to find a cure for. MVRF is a research foundation funding research to find a cure for macular degeneration. A cure is in sight. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dawn Pearl George, and I have the honor and privilege of being the executive director of the Macula Vision Research Foundation. And I'd like to say, I think this is the place to be this morning. And thank, I mean, all of you, it's overwhelming. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Beautiful fall day. I'm sure you have lots of other things on your calendar. And we're very happy that you made this a priority. So, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank our collaborative partner, the Center for Vision Loss. Uh, Doug Engling, our executive director, is with us and his team. I want to thank all our presenters. You'll learn a little more about each of them as we go along today. I want to thank the South Sales University for their um, uh, beautiful space and for being so wonderful to uh, work with. And we're really happy to be here in the Lehigh Valley. We've not been here before. This is our debut, uh, and so we're thrilled about it. I'm going to direct your attention to a bit short, short video that we're going to play that will tell you a lot more about Macula Vision Research Foundation. Macular degeneration is slowly robbing the sight of 11 million Americans. By the year 2020, this number is expected to be more than 20 million people. But we see a clearer future. We know a cure is on the horizon. Over the past 20 years, MPRF has given $20 million to the top scientists conducting the most credible and promising research around the world. For decades, macular degeneration was a mystery, something that happened to people as a part of aging. Now, because of MVRF-funded research, scientists know the nature of AMD. They are pioneering leading-edge genetic discoveries, plumbing the very depths of this devastating disease. Our work is fueling even more discoveries. Through gene therapy, we are now reversing childhood blindness and continue to make headway in advanced treatment methods for wet and dry AMD. We see macular degeneration going the way of polio and smallpox, a relic of the past, a footnote of history. We believe we're closing in. We're working every day so millions of people can keep their precious vision. It's the reason our founders, the Lawman family, started the NVRF, where 100% of every dollar donated goes directly to research in the field. That's the vision we can get used to. That's the world we can believe in. Because believing is seeing. MVRF is a 501c3 public charity, and we rely on support from believers like you. Thank you. Make sure you hear everything 
and are engaged in everything we do today. Thank you for doing that. I feel like a movie theater. Huh? I also have two other requests for you. One is, our hope is that, for today, is that you learn at least, at least one thing from today's presentation that you did not know when you walked in the door. That's our hope. The other thing we would ask you to do is when you walk out of here and enjoy your beautiful fall weekend, and you go about your busy lives, that you tell everybody you know about us. And the reason we need you to do that is because we are, as you heard, a 501c3 public charity. We are like the Arthritis Foundation. We are like the Diabetes Association or JDRF, okay? And we rely on support from people like you to fund the research that will find a cure for macular degeneration. That is our mission. That is our sole focus. And that is what we're going to do when we cross that finish line to help not only many of you in this audience, but generations to come. So if you tell everybody you know about us, I believe that we're going to get there. So the more money we raise, the more money we give to research, and the more research we fund. It really is that simple. So I'm going to introduce the, the, our very first speaker. Let me get my glasses on. Today we've got Dr. Mitchell Feynman joining us. Dr. Feynman, is, uh, his practice is Mid-Atlantic Retina, and I have to tell you, his comment to me earlier was that this room looks like his waiting room. How about that? So he's really comfortable being in this room right now, okay, but I promise you, he's going to have a lot to say that you're going to want to listen to. Um, Dr. Feynman is, uh, has been in the industry for over... 19 years? He doesn't look like he's old enough to be in the industry that long, right? Um, he obviously does teaching. He's an attending surgeon at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. And he's a busy guy. So we're very lucky to have him here to, to get to know all of you. Uh, he, uh, in between all of that, he has a family. He's got two tweenagers. So he's got his hands full, right? And he told me that as of yesterday, He's now the uh, doctor with the 76ers, right? So maybe he'll help them play a little better, okay? <laughs> maybe they just need to see the ball better. How about that? And then also, he is a physician with the Eagles. So go Eagles, right? So we know they're on the right track. They can see what they're doing. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Feynman. The title of this presentation is on your program. But he is, it is uh, age-related macular degeneration, current and future. So let's give a warm uh, welcome to Dr. Feynman. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, I see some of my patients in the audience, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Dr. Mitchell Feynman, I'm attending at Will's Eye, and I specialize in retina. So, uh, that's why today I'm hoping you learn more than one thing. I'm hoping there's several things. And I have an outline here of what we're going to be discussing. I'm trying to keep it nice and simple, but I also want to go into some depth in certain areas that may be of value to you. So we're going to talk about the difference between dry and wet macular degeneration. Again, most of you may already know this, but we'll review it quickly. And then I'm going to talk about the risk factors which ones we can change and which ones we can't. And then I'm going to touch on the treatment of both the dry and the wet. We're going to discuss genetic testing and then also the future. What is the research looking like at this point and what can we expect in the future? I think, do you need Dr. Martin to speak up just a little bit? Okay. Great. Okay. A little bit better? Yeah. So age-related macular degeneration is a degenerative condition. It occurs in the center of the retina, right where that fine vision is. And it is, at least in this country, the leading cause of blindness over the age of 50. 
It comes in two types, the dry, which accounts for 90%. And I'm going to go over the, the features of that. And also the wet. Although the wet only accounts for 10%, it accounts for the majority of the vision loss. Now, the problem is, most people start out with dry, but if you get the wet in one eye, you are at high risk for getting the wet in the other eye. Um, so that's a concern. And the estimates are that by 2030, with the population aging, that the risk from macular degeneration it's going to be higher than diabetic retinopathy and glaucoma combined. So in order to understand macular degeneration, I'm just going to briefly discuss the anatomy. The macula, as we call it, is the center of the vision. And that has the highest concentration of the cones. Remember from biology class, the rods and the cones? The cones are what give you your fine color vision. And this is a histopathologic section showing them all lined up very densely directly in the middle. That's where you get your fine vision. Underneath that sits the retinal pigment epithelium. And then finally, the blood supply, the choroid, is below that. So when we look at the classification of macular degeneration, everything's happening right in the center. It's the most common type is the dry, and it actually occurs in 10% of the population over the age of 55. That's quite a lot of people. These are degenerative changes only, but here's the, the problem. 10% of those cases will eventually turn wet. And that is the disease that gives you progressive vision loss. If you're going to have poor vision for macular, it is almost always due to the wet, due to growth of new blood vessels under the retina. That's why we call it wet. The blood vessels leak, they bleed, etc. So here is an example of dry, these are the drusen, the little yellow deposits filled with an unknown substance we call lipofusin for lack of a better term. We don't know really what it is. We think it's waste products from the processing of those cones. And that, that deposits right underneath the RPE, which is right underneath the retina. Geographic atrophy is another variant of dry where you just get loss of the tissue. And some of the newest research is looking at prevention or even reversal of the geographic atrophy. Fluorescein angiography, which many of you may know, is a tool that we use to diagnose and treat macular degeneration. A dye is injected into the arm vein and then it circulates through the vessels. And it gives us a lot of information about where these vessels are and how active they are. So as the drusen coalesce and build up with age, they turn into what's called a retinal pigment epithelial detachment. And that is here as a blister. You can see the dye from a fluorescein angiography pools in that area. And this is not supposed to be bright in the center. It's supposed to remain dark. And if you do another test, which many of you may know again, optical coherence tomography. And this uses a scanning laser to look at the retina. You can see the develop the accumulation of the lipofusin under the retina. The next step in the progression is that these abnormal blood vessels, you see now we're starting to talk about the wet, start to grow in that weak area underneath the retina. And when those blood vessels enter the subretinal space, these vessels are not normal. And it's not clear why the body chooses to react this way. But these vessels leak, and they also can bleed. On fluorescein angiography, we use that to diagnose them. There's different types, but you see that bright leakage from the dye is used to show the presence of these blood vessels. Now, OCT is, is also used routinely in the office. And you see now, not only do you have the PED with the blood vessels, you have evidence of leakage. The dark area represents fluid in the retina. And when the retina is swollen, it cannot function well. And that gives you profound central vision loss when it's active. In addition, these blood vessels can bleed. So when they get underneath the retina like that, they can rupture. And that can bleed under the retina or under the RPE. And here's an example of somebody who came in with sudden vision loss due to macular degeneration, due to bleeding. So what can we do about it? Well, there's certain things you can't change, and that is aging, 
anybody knows how, let me know. Whether or not you're farsighted, if you're farsighted, you're more likely to have this disease, but the most significant factor is your family history. And eye color kind of goes along with the genetics of that. So uh, if you have light eyes and fair skin, you're more likely to have this disease. If you have a first degree relative with this, you're more likely to have it. But here are the things that we can change, and that's where all of the attention has been. Cigarette smoking is the number one modifiable risk factor for macular. So if you have it, or if you have a family history of it, you should not smoke. That's cigars, pipes, cigarettes, anything. And now I have to mention marijuana, too. You shouldn't smoke anything. <laughs> for diet, um, we know that eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, especially the brightly colored ones, is healthy and prevents macular. And we also know that people who eat fish at least two to three times a week have a lower incidence. General things that result in cardiovascular disease, like being overweight, and lack of physical activity also go hand in hand with the development of macular. So staying fit is not just good for your heart, it's good for your eyes too. This is an example of one of my most compliant patients. You notice the wide brim hat and the wraparound sunglasses. Limiting sun exposure is important to preventing progression. So along those lines, looking for risk factors, about over 10 years ago, the age-related eye disease study was undertaken. And this was a long-term study looking at antioxidants, vitamin C, E, and beta carotene, as well as zinc for the prevention of macular degeneration. And there we have the antioxidants, and this is the zinc group. And basically, that was these nutrients were put up against placebo, or the sham treatment. So basically, some people got a sugar pill, and other people got the real nutrients. At the end of that study, it was very clear that eating, uh, taking these supplements resulted in a decreased risk of developing AMD. The top green line is the people who didn't take anything, and if you took both, you were the red line. So if you notice, everybody's getting a little bit worse, but you reduce the risk by about 25%. And I agree, this isn't perfect, but it's better than nothing. And that is what started the vitamin supplementation regimen that we now have evolved. So after the first ARID study, the recommendation was that people over 55, if you have intermediate or advanced AMD, you should use those vitamins. And additional studies had come out saying that smokers who took beta carotene had a higher risk of lung cancer. First of all, we advise people not to smoke, but if you did, you should not use the beta carotene. And when I get to the ARIDs too, we'll see that really became irrelevant. What else do we know about intake? I mentioned before, people who eat fish two to three times a week have a lower incidence of AMD. In addition, people who eat lots of fruits and vegetables and have high levels of these two carotenoids. And carotenoids are just the pigments that give fruits and vegetables their color, lutein and zeaxanthin. So based on this, the ARIDS-2 study, the second version of that study was taken. And that just was completed in 2013. This was a five-year study, and it looked at the original ARID supplements. And then in addition to that, we looked at whether or not the lutein zeaxanthine as supplements or the omega-3 fatty acids would be beneficial. They also took the opportunity to check if taking out the beta carotene made a difference or whether using less zinc was still just as effective. So what did we find here? Again, ARIDS 2 is the placebo. And by the way, the placebo, everyone used the regular ARIDS vitamins, and then they added to it the lutein, zeaxanthine, and the omega-3 fatty acids. This secondary randomization is what I'm talking about. So some people were given no beta carotene, and other people were given less zinc. So the conclusion was the beta carotene, thankfully, wasn't even necessary at all. So now we don't have that issue to worry about whether or not you smoked 20 years ago or when it you know, or whether you smoke now. We also found that the zinc was equally effective at the lower dose, which is good news because there were some side effects from the zinc. The other interesting finding here was at the dose used, and this comes up a lot now, 1,000 milligrams or one gram of the omega-3 was not effective. Unfortunately, the press has picked this up and, and the sound bites are that fish oil or omegas do not work for macular degeneration. I'm not sure about that, 
What I can tell you is one gram a day doesn't work, but there are multitudes of studies looking at fish consumption and the reduction. So all of those studies cannot be wrong. But right now, the jury is out. We know that the ARIDS-2 formula does not contain fish oil anymore. You may have noticed that it went from four pills a day back to two, for those of you who are using it. And that's the reason. So um, I still encourage my patients to eat fish. So what can we do? Sun protection, don't smoke, use the supplement studied in both the ARIDS and the ARIDS-2. B-complex vitamins have also been shown to benefit people with AMD. And I recommend that people eat fish at least two times per week. And if you are not a fish eater, you can consider a fish oil supplement. Fruits and vegetables, anything colorful. Greens, if you're not on Coumadin and you have to check with your doctor if you are. Uh, eating lots of green leafy vegetables are fantastic. So here's the problem now. The industry has really not caught up. I went online, this is just last week, and there are four different ICAPS vitamins out there, and I couldn't make heads or tails, and I'm a doctor. I don't know which one is the right one. Actually, none of these match the ARITS-2 recommendation. So what you have to look for, and I tried to make it fairly simple, there's multiple brands now. You want ARIDS-2 formula. That's a little small to see, but it says ARIDS-2. If you're looking for the appropriate vitamin, you want the ARIDS-2 formula. All right, wet AMD, I've tried to break it down for you, but basically wet AMD treatment right now, when the blood vessels do grow through the retina, is, is almost consolidated. Many of you may remember Macugen, that was the first injectable treatment for AM, wet AMD. And then we had Avastin, which is a long story. It's actually a colon cancer drug that is used off-label. And we had that before these Lucentis and Ileo were, were FDA approved. All of these work by inhibiting VEGF. Why do we care about VEGF? Remember I showed you the picture of the blood vessels growing up underneath the retina? That was stimulated by vascular endothelial growth factor. Nobody knows why that's produced in such large amounts in people with AMD, but it is. And we know that if we inhibit that, we can reduce the risk. So VEGF binds to the receptor and creates leakage, and it creates um, angiogenesis, which is just another word for abnormal blood vessel growth. So this is basically what we have right now. All of our current anti-VEGF treatments, macrogen, is an aptamer. It's a molecule that binds to VEGF and takes it out of commission. Lucentis and Avastin are antibodies that are made toward VEGF. And the new Anilea is a fake receptor called VEGF trap. And that binds it. So that's basically anybody who's receiving injections, you're getting one of those four. And they all work relatively similarly. The macrogen has really fallen out of favor because it's less effective. Here's a patient I was showing you that had a large bleed before. There are other things. We have a few surgical approaches, particularly for this type of condition, where this patient was brought to the operating room and the blood was removed. So occasionally there are some surgical options, but generally the injections are the way to go. I'm briefly going to talk about genetics and then research, and then we're going to wrap up. But we know that AMD is a genetic disease. 70% of the time it's associated with these genes. And the important thing that you need to know, if you have a first-degree relative with AMD, your risk goes significantly higher. So anybody with a family member who has this needs to be aware. My prediction about genetic testing is right now it's not relevant. And there's one good reason why. If I do genetic testing on you, I might tell you that you're at high risk. But I don't have anything different to offer except what we're doing now with the vitamins and with the frequent visits. So it's nice to know, but there will be a day very shortly where we have treatments that are based on your genetic profile. And you may have a risk factor that responds to a particular treatment while someone else may not. And that's where we're going to see the genetic testing really take off. Um, it will become mainstream, but right now there's a lot of attention to it. But I don't think it adds anything yet to your treatment. It will soon, hopefully. Research. 
There's a lot of research going on, but I want everyone here to understand when you hear it on the news, okay, not in a format such as this, the news likes to sensationalize these breakthroughs, unfortunately. I show this because you see this weeks or months for the phase two trials and years for the phase three trials. The problem is when they pick up on these studies, they make it sound like it's going to be released tomorrow. And unfortunately, we're still years away on many of these treatments. And I've just touched on a couple you may have seen in the news. This implant, we call it the retinal chip. This has a camera on the glasses that sends a signal back to the eye and implanted, if your retina, remember we looked at the macula, which is right here. If your macula is not functioning well, the, con the cones are no longer functioning. This chip is the first generation of electrodes that actually stimulate the retina in that area and can produce the sensation of sight. But in general, this is for people who are profoundly blind, who don't really see anything. Uh, most people with macular degeneration have that central loss but have peripheral vision. This would not benefit them at this time, but the technology is, you know, is changing so rapidly. It will. There's a picture of the macula with the chip sitting right on the center. So we're getting there, but you know how we have the iPhone getting better with each generation? This is going to get smaller and better as our technology advances. And that's where the research is so important. Many of you have heard of stem cells. Same thing. We're able to now put stem cells underneath the retina in the area where the, there's degeneration, and we may get to the point where we can turn those cells back into cones or rods that have degenerated. It's an exciting opportunity. But right now, we're in the early stages of this research. We're just trying to see if they survive and how they're accepted by the eye. So the Macular Vision Research Foundation, as you've already heard this morning, they award grants for research. And this is why it's so important. Every dollar that you give in donations, there is no money that's taken out for administrative purposes. It all goes to grants for these research projects. And one of them will be the next generation treatment uh, at some point. At Will's Eye, our research department has multiple studies now going on for the, both the dry and the wet. You see what happens. In the early days, every, all the research was for wet. And now that we have really basically improved our treatments for the wet, if you catch it early, all the attention is now going toward the dry. So it's a really exciting time uh, for research, and hopefully in the next several years we're going to have a really good treatment for the dry that will help prevent it from ever getting to the point of the wet. So, thank you for your attention. So now that we got you warmed up, right, a lot to take in, uh, and I want to make a couple comments before I introduce our next speaker. Dr. Feynman, of course, is spot on when he said, when he talked about dry and research and why there's so much more research in that area. Our scientific advisory board, every single one of them believe that if you can cure dry, you've got wet covered. And, the, and that's really important in the message because that wasn't necessarily the case you know, several years ago. So that's how far we've come. And we do like to take credit for it a significant part of that, but it, it takes a lot of people working really hard, doing everything they can, the clinicians, the scientists, the, the labs, all those pieces come together uh, to uh, get us further down the road. And that's the other theme that I want to talk about today that I hope that, that it starts to make sense for you as we move through the rest of the presentation. We feel very strongly that we need to stay connected to the people who we're trying to find a cure for, like all many, many of you in the audience, and your family members and your caregivers and your neighbors, because macular degeneration does not just affect you. It affects everyone around you, and we understand that, which is why we try to convene these sessions not with a bunch of doctors talking over and over again, which is wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. But we like to bring in a team of people who, have, who can talk with you about all the different parts of the spectrum. So Dr. Feynman touched on diet 
and nutrition. We have a dietitian who's going to be on the panel later. We have uh, other experts so that everyone is really helping you as, as uh, you learn and cope and live with the impact of macular degeneration. So the next person on the agenda I am very excited to introduce is Doug Yingling. He is the Executive Director of the Center for Vision Loss, and we are thrilled to be collaborating with them. They are an incredible agency, and I understand many of you are members, and the reason why many of you are here is because of the Center for Vision Loss. So we're very grateful to them, and we're excited about our partnership working together. Here is a couple of things you may or may not know, or here are a few things I should say you may or may not know about Doug. He's been the executive director at the Center for Vision Loss since 2010. Prior to that, he's worked in the field of vision loss for 25 years. So you've, you're getting a group here who is dedicated and committed to this field, which is outstanding. Doug uh, has been in the Lehigh Valley since 2008, but he grew up in Maryland, and he still returns there and visits with his father. His father is 95. Okay, and he's facing his own challenges with macular degeneration. So you see, there's always a connection. One in five of us, that's what I like to say. And Doug might be a little distracted when he gets up here today. You just have to bear with him. Because his daughter just got married and I'm not sure he's finished writing all the checks yet. <laughs> so, I'm sure it was a beautiful ceremony. I hear he got a new haircut for the occasion as well. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce Doug Eagling, the Executive Director of the Center for Vision Loss. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Yes, I got through the wedding fine. No crisis. Thank you for asking. Everything's good. The cake didn't fall over. Nothing terrible happened. Yes, um, you know, in the nonprofit world, um, that we, that we operate in, uh, there's a lot of talk and a lot of pressure to collaborate. It's a big word in the field, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. And I've, I've been in the field for a long time, and I can tell you that um, it's not always as easy as others may, may think it, it is. But when I learned about the opportunity to uh, collaborate today with the Macula Vision Research Foundation, uh, I thought, hooray, a collaboration that makes perfect sense. And why do I think that? Because I think that, um, in my experience, you have an opportunity to, to hear so many different points of view. You get the medical expertise um, that we've, we've learned about. You, you're going to have a chance to understand what products are here today um, that you might benefit from. But you also have the opportunity to learn about what kind of help and resources are available right here in our own community. Because the Center for Vision Loss is the local provider, the area's only community benefit organization dedicated to issues of vision loss. And we all want the, the vision research to succeed, as I'm sure it will. But my message to you today is, while we learn what treatment strategies are working, while we learn what advances research is achieving, let's take steps today. Steps that can be meaningful in dealing more successfully with vision difficulties. I sometimes think that it's human nature to think that we're the only one in town um, that's having a difficulty, but we know that we're not. Instead, I think maybe today it's useful to think of this problem as being somewhere on a continuum. For example, I heard such an, a, an interesting statistic last week. To accomplish the same task we did when we were 10 years old, we need six times as much light when we are 50 years old. And when we are 60, we need 15 times as much light as we did when we were 10 years old. So as someone who's turned 60, I can verify those statistics for you. <laughs> Um, sometimes I think I'm the only one who goes around in my house looking for a light that's strong enough to do what I need to do. But the answer is simple, Doug Yingling, get a better light. Um, so I'm on one side of the continuum. 
I need to make some minor changes to adjust to a normal aging process. But some of you are farther along in that continuum. And sometimes, by force of habit, we try to continue to do things the way we've always done them. But vision loss requires some flexibility, some adjustment, some reconsiderations, and an openness to recognize where you are and to be open to the changes you may need to make. So how can the, vision, the Center for Vision Loss help? Uh, locally, we do have, uh, I'll quickly tell you, just some main points. We have some casework services, I'm sorry, casework services. Our casework department is here today if you have any questions for us afterward. Um, they can help people in their own homes uh, with things like um, mail reading, bill paying, filling out applications for housing, anything that's vision related that you're having difficulty doing. We run a monthly support group. One of the best ways that people can learn from, from others is a support group environment where they're learning from others or they're learning from a facilitator who is himself visually impaired. Uh, we have educational programs of all kinds. So somewhere along the line we may offer an educational program that fits for you. Uh, recreation. It, it really has been well documented through research the importance of recreation, especially for people with vision impairment. Uh, vision impairment can be somewhat of an isolating condition. Uh, those of you that don't drive anymore know that that becomes a problem. So one of the things we do offer is recreation, a chance uh, to, to get out with others and, and just recreate together. Uh, transportation, uh, we mostly specialize in getting people to medical appointments. Uh, we spend a lot of time and effort on doing that. Uh, we brought some of you here today to, to this seminar. So our transportation department is there. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit about Low Vision Clinic uh, in a few minutes. And we, we also have a store um, where you can try some of the different devices, some of which you might, might see here today. One thing I will mention, uh, professionally we have a relationship here in Pennsylvania with the Bureau of Blindness and Visual Services. And sometimes that's beneficial because they can offer some supplemental programs that we as an agency don't have. So uh, it's something that we can, uh, we can provide for you. We as an agency will also be um, investing in some new technology. And we hope that once ahead, uh, you may be able to come to our center and see some new devices. Um, if you're on our newsletter mailing list and so on, you'll, you'll get a notice of that. And I did want to mention finally one more device. Don, this is a this is a debut. This is the newest uh, model of it's called my um, my mobile light cane. And for those of you who can't see, it's a it's a support cane, and it has a, a real bright light on the bottom. And the center is going to be taking the first shipment of these um, next week, and I think it's a great idea. Um, this is something that's perfect for my father with macular degeneration. Uh, my dad lives in a retirement community, he gets along fine. But if you go out to a restaurant and he's going to get home after dark, it's a totally different story. His vision goes down to, to almost zero. So um, this is something brand new, and if you want to see it, you can come to our center to see it. So in closing, uh, vision loss might be a new challenge for you or one that you've been living with for years, but you don't have to go through it alone and you don't have to have your answers piecemeal. Use the Center for Vision Loss if you need help, need information, or have a question. Our staff have been in the business for years. We know a lot of resources, all dedicated to vision issues. You want to know how to continue to do woodworking after you lost your vision? There's actually a couple websites dedicated to that. You want to know how to read the newspaper? There's a free service that can read the newspaper to you. Ever heard of the Talking Book Program? Our staff can connect you. And I'll leave you with that thought from the Center for Vision Loss. Our staff can connect you. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. That cane is great. Thanks for bringing that. Everyone, feel free to check that out. I'm sure Doug will show, give you a little demo, right? Sure. They do some really important things. And now we're starting to get the sense of community in the room, right? This is a, a group of us, 
helping all of you and vice versa. Um, real quick, I just want to point your attention to, I know all of you have the plastic bags with the packets in them. I just want, you don't necessarily have to pull them out. I just want to let you know there's uh, information about the Center for Vision Loss in there. There's information about nut nutrition, as Dr. Feynman referred to. There's our support site newsletter, and all of you are who registered today will be on the newsletter list. This is an incredible, if I do say so myself, publication chock full of really a uh, variety of information that you really don't get other places. People love this. Goes out to, to 30,000 people all over the country. So uh, now all of you will be receiving that, so I think we'll think you'll enjoy it. Uh, and there are other things in that, some giveaways. There's a 2020 pin. We're going to talk about that later when the gadget people get up here. So just want to let you know what's in your goodie bag. All right, next on deck. You still with us? Okay, let's do a reality check. How's the room? Are you hot, cold, okay? Okay, how about lighting? Can you see okay? You all right with that? Too bright? Too dim? Too bright? Is, I knew that was going to happen. I should have asked that. <laughs> okay. How about it's perfect? It's perfect, right? All right. All right. You can hear okay, right? Okay, so speak up if you can't, because that's important. All those things are important. We want to make you happy. We care about you as you're uh, there in the audience. Well, we're, we have one more um, expert to introduce in uh, before we break. And um, this is very apropos. Uh, Dr. Anthony Silvetti is next on deck. He is an OD, and he directs the Low Vision Clinic at the Center for Vision Loss. Here, right here in this area, many of you may know him. He may take care of you, which is a good thing. He uh, has been there for 14 years. Dr. Silvetti has graduated from Bloomsburg University and the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, and he completed an externship. I gotta find out what that is. Um, I, I know internship, but I'm imagining that's external, at the Fine Bloom Vision Rehab Center in Philadelphia. So we do know that, so that's good. So Dr. Silvetti is, is a, a low vision doctor, so he's another piece of the little chain here we're trying to create for you. And he's got a lot to say, too. Thank you, Dr. Silvetti. Good morning.
for most people that means pretty much nothing. The actual and more practical definition of low vision is when a person, a patient, cannot see or do their usual everyday routine, read the newspaper, watch television, write checks with regular glasses or contact lenses and they need some other assistance, some other help. There are many, many causes of low vision. The most common that I see is macular degeneration by far. Now the reason for a low vision exam is to determine the means such as magnifiers and other devices that would compensate for a patient's remaining vision, enhance a patient's ability to perform routine tasks, improve quality of life, which is very important, and restore independence, which for a lot of patients is most important. One of the things that's very important in a low vision evaluation is patient history what their living environment is. It's different, individuals have different needs based on their living environment. For example, if somebody lives in a facility that's assisted living, their needs are going to be less, they're going to have to be required to do less than if they're independent living. Likewise, a person who lives alone has more demand on their, uh, on their needs and tasks than if they have others in the household to help them with certain things. Everybody has different concerns with their vision loss. Everybody's an individual, everybody's different. Some people, and many people, the main thing is reading. But reading what? Some people don't really have an interest in reading the newspaper. They want to read their Bible, or they want to read uh, recipes, or they want to read mail from their family and friends. And there are other things that people have issues with um, using appliances, seeing food on their plate, um, seeing their insulin, if they're a diabetic, seeing the syringe. So everybody has different needs and likewise to help with those needs there are different ways to do that, different types of low vision devices and aids to help with that. It's also important how a patient perceives their loss of vision. Everybody's going to perceive their loss differently. It's not just what their visual acuity is, but it's how their perception is and how the vision loss or visual impairment impacts their everyday life. So it's how they perceive the loss of vision. One other thing that's a big, big factor in patient success with low vision is their motivation. Patient has to be interested in possibly having to use new ways to read or new ways to do something because it's not going to be just changing and a lot of people ask me can you just give me stronger glasses so I can read my newspaper again often that's not the case it's, you have to go with other devices such as what you'll see later on in the in the room now one thing I'm going to step aside for a second one thing that's important, the first thing I need to check after the history is a patient's visual acuity. And I brought along the chart that I use. It's different than the chart you would see in your general optometrist, ophthalmologist, or, or a specialist office. The standardized chart is a projector chart, and the big number, the big letter rather, is always the big E. That's 2400. There are some visually impaired individuals that are not quite as good as 2400, but they do have vision that can be measured. And the, the chart that I use is a handheld chart. It does allow for good contrast. It's done at 10 feet. That way you could do it in almost any room. And the largest character, it's all numbers, the largest character some of you can probably see this. I know I'm far away from the back. The largest character is approximately three times the size of the big E. So that will tell me a lot more about what a patient's vision is. Because I like to know if they ha what their visual acuity is, not just it's worse than 2400. And they also have reading charts along the same lines where it starts out larger and then it works itself down. 
Now, one other thing that needs to be done in a low vision eval is to evaluate the refraction. That's when you check somebody's eyeglass prescription to see if that would help. In most cases, when I see a patient, change in the glasses would not make any real significant improvement in their vision. We have to go above and beyond regular glasses to different magnifiers. Now, speaking of magnifiers, and again, you'll be seeing some of these later on, um, there are a wide variety of devices that can be used. There are handheld magnifiers, which a lot of you are probably well familiar with. Some of you have probably purchased in area stores. Um, there are stand magnifiers that just stand on the page. It's easier for people to use if they have trouble holding a magnifier steady. Um, there, are, there are magnifier low vision aids that look like glasses, but they're very strong lenses where a person would have to hold the reading material anywhere from two to eight inches away. So that's an adjustment. That's where somebody would have to be motivated, like I said before, to make a change. You have to, you're used to reading at 16 inches or so, now you need to read at five inches or so. But it, the, the glasses often do work. There are, and you'll see these later, these are very popular and very good electronic magnifiers. There are tabletop, which you can see over on the side, and there are also portable electronic magnifiers. When I say electronic magnifiers, it's a magnifier that incorporates a camera in it. Whatever you're focusing on, a newspaper, a book, projects it on a screen. You could change the magnification, so if you're looking at a phone book, you need more magnification than if you're looking at headlines in a newspaper. It could change contrast. Some people don't like black on white. A lot of times with a newspaper, it's black on gray. Newspapers aren't white. They have the means to, you change the contrast, it enhances the white, and you have a truer black on white. And there are other color combinations as well. There are also devices for seeing at distance and for watching, watching television, because a lot of people, an issue is not able to follow a television program or see television like they used to. There are three main things that need to be compensated for with vision loss. Three ways you can compensate. Magnification, the thing with magnification, the lower the power, the smaller the letters, but the wider the field. You can see more words or sentences. Likewise, if you go with a high magnification, say a handheld magnifier, you will have much larger magnification. The characters, the letters will be bigger, However, the field will be smaller. You only get a few letters in the field. Contrast, as I mentioned before, is very important. The better the contrast, the easier it is to see objects. Type of contrast that works best for most people is black and white. There are other options, but black and white works best. Um, sometimes, and I've seen this with a lot of menus, they'll, pick, they'll print navy blue on light blue, or red on pink. It's very difficult to read that. If you have black on white, or reverse, white on black, it's, the contrast is much starker, much better, much easier to read. Illumination is a very important thing. Um, with illumination, three main types. There's overhead lighting, which is designed to light up a room. There are lamps, like end table lamps with a shade. The problem with that is the shade disperses the light. The best type of light is a direct task light. That's a light that would, uh, they, I call them a, a, a gooseneck lamp. You can adjust it. You can move it so it's direct, and the bulb is directed directly at the page. That way you get all the light on the page. One minute. One minute. Okay, I'm gonna talk real, real fast. Um, I don't have two cards left. Sunglasses are very, very important. What they would do, especially if they're polarized, is reduce glare. And glare is a major concern of a lot of patients, especially with macular degeneration. They also protect from ultraviolet radiation, ultraviolet light. Best type is usually like an amber, copper type color for macular degeneration, but everybody's different. There are some people who prefer gray, which is also a very popular color. 
for indoors, I have some patients who have a concern with light. It's even too bright for them. So you go with a light yellow. So lighting is important. You need a lot of light to read, but sometimes if you get too much light and glare, you have, especially outdoors, you have to cut that back. Um, in conclusion, there are many, many ways to compensate for anywhere from mild to severe vision loss, but it depends on the patient's or person's needs and interests. Um, one other thing I want to mention real quick about contrast, one other thing that's non-reading or non-optical, same food on the plate. It's easier if you have contrast. So in other words, if you would have, say, flounder, mashed potatoes, you don't want to put it on a white plate because it's going to just mesh in. You want to put it on a black plate or navy blue plate. Likewise, if a white plate would use with food that bright color like red beans. Um, my time is up. <laughs>
comes to this stage as an occupational therapist because we're starting to understand better. Again, talking about that team, that, that you know why people fall, older people fall? Maybe it's because they can't see very well. Maybe it's because they have macular degeneration or geographic atrophy or atrophy, or they're, they're losing their vision. You know what? A lot of occupational therapists and, and medical prof allied medical professionals are not trained necessarily to think about that. Imagine that. So Debbie brings that, that uh, rehab piece to the equation. Um, and she'll be able to chime in here as we go through some of the questions and answers. And then we've got the line up here, Dr. Feynman and Dr. Silvetti, and also my very best friend on the planet is on the end, Charlie Collins. Charlie is on your agenda. Uh, I'm going to introduce Charlie. He's going to talk to us a little bit. He'll probably come back at the end and wrap things up. Um, why is Charlie my very best friend forever? Charlie and I just met. Okay? I know what you're thinking. The one thing you might know about, not know about Charlie is that Charlie can't see. Okay? Gets me every time. But Charlie's going to talk with all of us for a little while and share his stories because he's got a story to tell. And I am bound and determined to get his story out to the world. He already does that. He's an international uh, inspirational speaker. And you have, we've got him right here in the Lehigh Valley, so we're pretty lucky. Thank you, Charlie. I'll bring you the mic. Oh, where's my mic? Up here. She has it, but Debbie has it. Oh, Debbie has it, sorry. I cannot speak sitting down that well. Thank you, Dawn. You're welcome. Thank you, MBRF, for putting this event on. Dawn and I are BFFs because I haven't screwed up yet. <laughs> I believe that no matter what type of vision impairment you may have, frustrations and struggles you're facing day to day, there is hope and a solution for you. How do I know that? Well, I'm going to share a bit about me that qualifies me for standing up on this stage. First, I want to ask you a question, or actually tell you a statement. Did you know the number one thing that limits a blind person is their vision? <laughs> I got a group of smart ones. <laughs> Did you know the number one thing that limits a sighted person is their vision? Did you know where there is no vision, people perish? After two years of being in and out of doctor's offices, my parents and I, along with my four sisters and brother, in our one car, station wagon, finally headed up to Mass and Air. Where after two years of testing our family, we were sat down and we were delivered some pretty uh, horrific news. Said, sorry, four of your six children have a disease in the eye called juvenile macular degeneration. There's nothing we can do. I was waiting for the pill or the pair of glasses, which I wasn't even happy about, but I was going to wear them. He said, then don't go skiing anymore. Don't do sports in school. Things are going to get hard for you. Print is going to get hard. You're going to find that things are going to start really changing in your life. So you've got to be really careful. And when we walked out of that doctor's office, my mother took that piece of paper, crumpled it up, and threw it in the first garbage can. And the lesson in that is, the one thing you don't want to do to people with vision impairment or any adversity in life is enable them. We want to be able to do what we can do. <clears throat> so this is when I truly became blind in my life. Why is that? Be up to that point before any of us go to, well, first of all, how many people in this room have some type of vision impairment or macular degeneration? Raise your arm really high. Holy gosh, there's a lot of you here. <clears throat> I pretend I saw all those arms. <laughs> But you know what? You're not alone. 
And I felt that way for most of my life, even living with two girl, two sisters and a brother. I still felt alone. Nobody got it. <clears throat> I say I went blind when the doctor told me, because that's when my thinking changed. Blindness is caused by your thinking. It's not caused by a thing in your eye. The eye doesn't even do the scene. We see with our brains, we don't see with our eyes. I wish I knew all that back then, because I was focused. I mean, vision is the number one thing we do <clears throat> for our senses. So, what happened to me? I went and fell into an I can't mindset. I can't do this. I can't see the chalkboard. I can't read books. I can't. I can't. I can't. And because of that, <clears throat> The world around me collapsed. Faces went away, chalkboards went away, printing school books went away. Are you nervous? No. Stop. I'll never find it. <laughs> so, I'm just kidding. Uh, and she put the lid on, she knows I'll kick it. <laughs> And you know what, you're doing something that's really important with low vision is to laugh. Don't be so hard on yourself. You're not a loser. At least I'm just sharing what I used to think I was. You're not less than, you're no, you are good enough. Heck, when you're out at a restaurant, you eat some plastic decoration on your plate, and you go, what the heck is this? <laughs> laugh at it. Certainly laughing at me. And then I take it out and I go, you know, where's that cook? That guy's an idiot. Why would I want plastic on my plate? <laughs> so I, uh, I, 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 my, my head went down. My self-esteem went down. My, my parents' uh, relationship went down. My relationship, I turned to alcohol. I turned to drugs. I did things in my life to try to find my place of happiness. And all that happened was I got sicker and sicker. And what does macular degeneration do to Charlie? It took out his whole life. That little thingy in the back of my eye, my little drusens were getting thicker, and I was getting, you were disappearing, my whole world, my hopes and dreams were gone, and I couldn't imagine it anymore. I'm landscaping up at a motorcycle dealership. <clears throat> I had a motocross bike, by the way. I rode motorcycles. <laughs> I skied. I pole vaulted in high school. I drove my parents' car when they were sleeping. <laughs> uh, I had done everything I shouldn't do. Because I'm, don't tell me not to do something. I'm going to do it. Um, I want to prove to those people that I'm not a loser. See, but I don't have to do that anymore today, even though I still do, for you to like me. See, I thought I was less than, not good enough, and people weren't going to like me because of a disease in my eye. And if that person is out there, they're the loser, not me. Wow, well, I was laying, I cut the grass at a motorcycle dealership. The owner came out to tap me on the shoulder. And I thought he was going to tell me, you're done. You don't do a good enough job around here. But the lawn was always perfect. He said, hey, I was wondering if you wanted to work here. What? Why would he ever ask a legally blind loser if he wants to work at a motorcycle dealership? That didn't come out of my mouth, but it went into my head. And did you know, the next thought was, how did he know? I love this place. Well, you're in here all the time buying stuff in your motorcycle. And I'd see, like, I'd like to give you an opportunity. I said, what do you want me to do? Sell motorcycles. Cool. Well, I went home and told my mother, and she thought I should do that. I thought you are just being my mother. Maybe you should go do it. Um, but deep down, years of blocking my, my whole purpose and who I am as a person was keeping that part of me that was going to come out in the very near future. Well, I listened to my mother and I went upstairs and I laid in bed in that same bed that I lied in for years and cried myself to sleep. That same bed that I looked up to that power greater than myself and I said, tonight would be a good night if you took me. This night was different. I didn't ask God to take me. Well, I was mad at it anyway. I didn't ask I didn't cry. I fell asleep soundly. I got up in the morning. I said, I can, I can, I can. I walked in at a motorcycle dealership. I said, Jimbo, I'd love to take the job, but you got to know, I'm legally blind. And by the way, I'm so glad I'm not illegally 
blind. <laughs> I should be, after what I did out there. And you can certainly read my book and find out all the dirt on me. Um, which is over there. Uh, he said, I believe in you. There's some, you love, I believe in you. I believe in you. I kept running in my head. Somebody believes in me? Heck, I failed out of school. I failed out of college. I failed in everything I did in life. And really, I didn't. I feared. So, I said, Jim, but I need help. I need devices. I need things. I never used them all the way up there. It was blind people use that stuff, not me. <laughs> so, I got my very first Optelec CCTV, which we have here, but they were nothing like they are today. But it was good enough. Did you know the brain is a muscle and the brain will go into atrophy if you don't use it? Of course, just like, you know, the guns, the arms, the muscles, you break, you know what happens. I don't want to say it. All right, so the brain can go in, mine did. I had read in 10 years. I had to relearn how to, uh, how to brain, yeah, how to read. I had to relearn how to write. All of a sudden, with, I was reading like crazy. I had my Optolet CCTV. I had dark writing pens. I had lighting that you see over there. I had pocket magnifiers, and I had a new way of life. Within a few short days, I was ignited. You know what happened? In three short years from that day, first I became a million dollar salesman. Second, in three short years, I became the vice president, part owner of a multi-million dollar corporation as a legally blind loser who once thought that way. We become what we think about all day long. Ralph Waldo Emerson. I guarantee you know that dude is. Very good writer. So, if you focus on what you can't do, guess what you're going to do? That. Nothing. <laughs> if you focus on what you can do, you'll have... So, ask questions each day. How can I? What is the best thing I can do about this? And I'm not going to sit up here and tell you much more about my story, but I have gone from frustration to freedom. I do not get up and think about having a vision impairment most days of my life. But actually, never. I work with so many people. I'm always giving and trying to teach you how to see again. I forget I have it. Until I start driving somebody's car, I remember. <laughs> so... Uh -oh. I hate having peripheral vision. I'm only kidding. <laughs> so hey, I'm done. I was going to do an exercise, and if we have time, I'll do it. It's a fun exercise. You um, can do it. I can do it. Okay. Can do it. All right. So everybody, watch out. I'm going to get shorter. <gasps> All right. I knew the floor was big. Don't worry. There's a formula called E plus R equals O. The events in your life plus your response equal your outcome. Just like 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? If you don't like 4, change one of the numbers. <laughs> but 2 plus 2 is 4. E plus R equals O. The events plus my response give me my outcome. All right. May I ask your name? Helen. Helen? Helen. I'm going to do a little test on you. The red does not look good on you, and I don't really like your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you think the thing that raised Helen's self-esteem or lowered it? Okay, so you weren't listening to my example in the beginning. E plus R equals O. The event in your life plus your response to deliver your outcome. Helen could have said, you know, Charlie doesn't know what he's talking about. I look good in red. <laughs> she could have said, you know, this Collins guy's an idiot. I think he's talking to me and picking on me because he has a crush on me. <laughs> what do you think that's going to do? That's going to raise her self-esteem and her self-confidence. So I wanted to just tell you that no matter what events happen in your life, the doctor tells you got macular, let's get through that feeling. Know that feeling. Go through the depression shortly. But step outside of that and know that each event, if you want a better outcome in life, Respond differently from today forward. Thank you. Do we want to try or what? Absolutely, you're going to want to try, see? 
No, seriously, there you go. We love him. So just real quick, his book is here. It just came out. And um, he, we're at the end of the Q&A session, we're going to raffle off a signed copy by Charlie. Okay? He's a rock star, ladies, I'm telling you. No takes. No takes yet. Not yet. Not yet. He, that's next, right? I can't see it to read it. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. All right. Now, here's time where we leave you. Are you ready with your questions? Because I know our uh, esteemed panel of experts is ready with the answers. I can guarantee that. So we've got Ms. Lynn Rinaldi, who has the roving microphone, and Mr. Ron. What? Do you have the microphone? I just, oh, I didn't see it in your hand until I knew it. Okay, and Ron's going to run around on this side of the room. Okay, first question. Let's get some hands up in the air. Oh, right here. Oh, my goodness. All right, and please, here's what we want to do. Say your name, state your question, and if we have to, we'll figure out who's going to answer it, but if we have to say it again, we will, so everybody can hear. Okay. My name's Tom Nyweister, and this is uh, for Dr. Feynman. Um, you, closed your, you closed your talk about, uh, uh, on research and how progress is being made, you know, towards this macular degener degeneration, and good things were going to happen, you know, over the, you know, near the horizon. Well, on, on, the, on the horizon, well, my mom, 95 and a half years, 95 and a half years old, so she wonders how far that horizon is. Good question. You want to take that and I can add to it? Well, you can't speed up research like this because the main, the main point here is we don't want to do any harm. So I can go back and give you numerous examples of therapies that were touted as being fantastic that turned out to be quite the opposite. So I know as much as you know at this point. We have these studies, and the reason we call them studies is we really don't know what the outcome is going to be. So we generally have a placebo group or a standard care group, and then we have our new treatment. And we, we compare it. If it's successful, it goes on to the next phase of the study. If I have to give an estimate, and again, this is me, my opinion, I would say within the next five years, we are going to have a treatment for the dry on the market, FDA approved, ready to deliver to the patients. And that might be a conservative estimate, but the studies are already in progress, phase three trials. So we're getting there, and I think, you know, when she's 105, we'll have a cure for what she has. That's right. And you're going to get there too, right? All right, good. Uh, thank you, Dr. Feynman. And I just want to add to that, just from our, and the, I think all of you figured out, I am not a researcher, okay? But I know enough to be dangerous. And I will tell you that our research as a collective, our researchers and scientists as a collective group really do believe and agree with Dr. Feynman. And that within 10 years or so, because ophthalmological research, it's very difficult to say, is accelerating really quickly right now. There's a lot of resources, and I have to say MVRF is helping to lead that way, being put into the basic research to get to the point where they're actually doing the trials. So it takes all of us to get that research out of the laboratory and to help your beautiful young mother, right? And the generations to come. Next one. All right, you're gonna have to run. You can see Ron, that's a great color to be wearing. Hi, my name's Beth, and my question's for Dr. Feynman. Could you speak on macular pucker just a little bit? Sure. Everybody hear that? Okay. The only thing macular pucker has in common with macular degeneration is the word macular. They're completely different diseases. So macular pucker is actually one of those diseases maybe 20 years ago when I was in training, we didn't have anything to do for it. And now it's come full circle. We have macular holes and puckers, which is sort of a continuum. And that is a surgical problem. And with a sutureless surgery that takes maybe 30 to 40 minutes, it is a correctable problem now. So there's an example of how far we've come with research and technology. Um, the only reason we, you know, it's macular pucker because it's a, a fibrotic membrane
that develops on the surface of the macula. The same area that macular degeneration affects, but as macular degeneration starts from the lower levels and comes forward, this is on the surface, so it's very accessible. If we could do that with the blood vessels and macular degeneration, it would be a miracle. The problem is they're underneath the retina, so you have to go through the retina to get them with macular degeneration. That's why there's no surgical option. But with macular pucker, it's right on the surface, and using a forceps, or basically a word for tweezers, we enter the eye, and we remove that. Um, we do, that is probably the most common surgery that we do at Will's Eye here. Interesting stuff. Okay, over here, then we've got one in Ron. We're gonna have another lady over here. Okay, next question. Um, I'm Elsie Legrisso, and my question is for whoever, why do they call it age-related macular degeneration when there's so many young people with it? And I, I was di diagnosed 25 years ago. So when you were 19? <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right, that's a, that's a very good question. Now, how about if I throw that out to, uh, we'll give Dr. Feynman a break for a minute, because everybody saw on his slide that he even stated, as do we, that it's age 50 and above, and that's not old. You're right. So, uh, Dr. Silvetti, you want to comment on that? Sure. Well, with the macular degeneration, it's, as you mentioned, it's called age-related macular degeneration because it starts later on in life, 50s, 60s, and older. There is juvenile macular degeneration, exactly speak on that better, which starts much younger in life. I, there was a term that they used to use before age-related macular degeneration, and I think that's one you would like even less, senile macular degeneration. Oh. <laughs> For some reason, they, they changed the name, I don't know why. But to answer your question, because it starts later in life than early in life, just to divide it between the two. So what Charlie had was regular... Yeah, it's juvenile macular degeneration. At the time, it was not called... It's now called Stark Arts. You might have heard that. But it wasn't called that at the time, right, Charlie? Did Charlie tell you he's 47, by the way? Did you say that? No. Okay. I, I... So, Deb, do you want to... Debbie uh, McKay, do you want to comment on that at all? Any comment about that? Dr. Feynman? No, I think... So. Okay. So your our vote in this room is we should take the A off. Is that what I'm hearing? Age related. So now it's just macular degeneration. Okay, good point. That's right. All right. Next, I think we had a, a lovely woman here in the front row. My name is Gloria. My question is for Dr. Feynman. My retina specialist, Dr. Chen. He said that you are presently working on removing scar tissue from the eyes. My question is, will this restore any of our vision if we have macular degeneration? So that is kind of a follow-up to the previous question about... Yeah. Push it on the bottom. Push it on the bottom. Push it hold. Thank you. Push it hold. Maybe sleeping. We work. Yeah. The problem <clears throat> with surgical approaches to removing, well, what I didn't mention in my talk is in the early days, before we had a treatment for the wet, we really didn't have any way to stop the natural history. And if you don't treat wet or you don't catch it early, as many of you know who came up to me during the break, the blood vessels will eventually grow to the point where they kind of collapse upon themselves. And then you end up with a scar which is the end stage. The scar can occupy a good part of the central vision, so you always have your peripheral vision. And the problem is where the scar is. There was a submacular surgery trial, this is going back 15 years, where they actually looked at whether or not they could physically do surgery and remove the scar tissue with macular degeneration to try to restore some vision. And what we found is what I alluded to before. When you remove the scar tissue, the cones and all that stuff that's formed in that scar came out together. 
and it was not successful for age-related macular degeneration. Only things like macular pucker, which grow on the surface of the retina where you're very carefully removing the scar tissue but not disturbing the retinal tissue, are the ones that are successfully treated with scar tissue removal. Okay, our glorious second comment is that most of the scarring was due to all the laser treatments you had. Okay. And what was the last part? And you're asking him what? I'm asking if this would correct the scar tissue from the laser treatment. Okay. Unfortunately, the laser forms a scar deep in the retina, just like the natural history. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't even bring it up. We hardly ever use laser for macular. At the time you had it, my presumption is there was nothing else and that's why a lot of people were treated with laser. So, unfortunately, I don't think there's anything surgically to remove that scar at this point. I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Other questions? All right. <laughs> thank you. This is a question for Dr. Feynman. I uh, am. I have wet macular degeneration in my right eye only. I'm a patient of mid Atlantic retina and I received regular Lucenta shots. As part of that, uh, for the last five years, I've been taking AREDS, the standard one, along with a uh, fish oil supplement. I noticed that you were recommending that we change AREDS 2. Is it beneficial to change AREDS 2 or should I stay with the regular ones and with the fish oil supplement? Great question. That is a good question. So. You may not know this, but many of the companies that sell the fish oil supplement with the accompanying vitamin, and they have to be separate because the fish oil is, is a fat, and the vitamins are water-soluble, and they can't put them in one pill. So you may check into this, but many of the companies, when the Herod's 2 study came out, automatically updated their formula to reflect the new findings. If they didn't, then I agree. If you're buying it piecemeal, then you need to upgrade to the AREDS too. In fact, you still can find the original AREDS formula vitamins, but most of them have moved to replace the beta carotene with the lutein and zeaxanthin on the shelf. I'd like to ask uh, Debbie Cooper to comment on that as a dietitian. Can you just add to that? First of all, I want to say what a great job Dr. Feynman did with uh, addressing the He's like an honorary dietitian here. And um, I had the same issue as he um, had explained when I was researching, you know, for this program, looking at the different supplements that were out there. When I was looking what was in the AREDS 2 um, study and trying to determine what was in the different components of all the different vitamins that were out there, my head actually hurts. And I do think that what you want to hone in is in looking for the AREDS 2. Uh, when you're looking at it for the supplement. Okay, good. Who else has got it? Sure, go ahead, Debbie, too. I would just like to, I'm not a uh, nutritionist, however, um, I am a diabetes educator, so I always look at nutrition, and I came across a very good resource that you might want to look into, and it is a cookbook. It's called The Visionary Kitchen. It's a cookbook by an optometrist, and she focuses on recipes that include products that are healthy for your eyes. This is just from 2013. And in the front of the book, she talks about uh, all kinds of food products, which ones contain lutein, xanthine, beta carotene. Uh, she gets into different, aspect, di different eye diseases. And then she gives you a whole compendium of recipes from appetizers to entrees um, to desserts. I also want to put a really good plug in for kale. I know probably a lot of you think of kale and say, oh, that's what they put as the decoration in the meat. Or in your garden. Well, kale is different now. You can get baby kale. And I'm also going to plug another place. I, I recently ate a kale salad at a supermarket, believe it or not, and it was outstanding. Okay, it was called Super super Salad. It was kale, blueberries, uh, some form of nut, but it had all the products, 
and I'm not going to put a plug for Weiss's, but this is where I found it. I'm sure other supermarkets will make it. But kale can be eaten in salads. I put it in stir fries. I can put it in scrambled eggs. The kind of kale that's today is not that, it doesn't have to be that bitter, terrible tasting kale of the past. Okay, great. So Thank you. Look at, look at all the things in the food products. Do you want to add any more to that? On the green? Why don't you talk about the green stuff? Yeah. Okay, um, what I think first of all is what I'd like to do is bring it back to food, okay? Because I think first of all, you know, supplements may be appropriate for some individuals, but a healthy diet is appropriate for everyone, okay? Some of the components of the diet are, um, as, as Dr. Feinstein um, had spoken about, was the, um, you know, the lutein and zeaxanthin, um, which is in the colored vegetables, the dark green leafy uh, vegetables, fruits, having at least like three servings of fruit or so a day, um, your fish, trying to have fish um, two to three times a week or so. Some of the other research that's out there when it comes to, I'll just say macular degeneration, um, has to do with, um, Reducing your alcohol intake, okay? Reducing your amount of simple refined sugars and increasing the fiber in your diet, okay? Um, so that there are, there are other things that you want to do with your diet. Um, making sure that you're eating fresh fruit instead of um, commercial, um, fresh foods instead of commercial products because of the benefits, the health benefits of it. If you're someone with hypertension, keeping that in control, which may be controlling your sodium in your diet. If you have issues with um, high cholesterol, and because and, and, that is also a risk factor for um, macular degeneration, watching the amount of fats in your diet, eating the healthier fats, and getting those fish you know, into, into your diet are very important. Trying to get exercise in there, trying to watch your weight. So all that brings you down to the basics of a good, healthy diet. And that's a baseline for, for everyone. And when it comes to macular degeneration, and even prevention. Charlie, you want to comment on eating? You're, you're living proof, huh? Well, I, I, I don't know, maybe in 2005 or six, I switched how I ate. And it wasn't easy at first, but over time, I started eating more raw, whole, organic type foods and put some chia seed in my foods and I've been drinking shakes and eating more vegetables and fruits and oh my gosh my life got so much better. I got less grumpy. I, I didn't, uh, my eyes didn't tire as much. They didn't feel red and I didn't have to, my whole body improved but it really helped my macular degeneration. It's uh, So I'm living proof that eating well and exercising is a huge uh, benefit in life. Good. Other questions? Okay, how about over here? We'll get to you, I promise. Hi, my name is Pat. Um, could you touch just a little bit on the Manet syndrome and is there anything that can be done about it? That's a Dr. Feynman. And we get that question every seminar. Charles, we're talking about Charles Bonet syndrome. Charles Bonet was actually a Swiss naturalist. His father. His father was affected with this. So Charles Bonet syndrome occurs. Has anyone heard of phantom limb syndrome, where someone who's had an amputation feels something in the limb that's been amputated? It is the ocular equivalent of that. Okay, and your brain has memory of vision that it would see at some point. And when you lose your vision, and it's usually people with bilateral vision loss your brain will insert in images from memory. And nobody really understands this, why it happens, because it's intermittent, it'll come on, last for a month or two and disappear. They have tried antipsychotic medicines. It is not hallucinations, you're not hallucinating. The biggest problem is recognition of the disease, if it is a disease, that is. Because people get very upset, they don't want to tell anybody that they're seeing these pictures of flowers or faces or whatever it is that people see. And rarely it's a scary image that they see. But generally, if people understand what they're experiencing is a normal variation of people with bilateral vision loss, they're much more comfortable with it. And we, you know, we talk about it, but once the anxiety level comes down, people accept it. And it goes away by itself, generally. 
Right. It's a very common question, but I think it's more common than we actually think. Do you, do you agree? When you ask about it, yeah. uh, and again, people are embarrassed because they think that they're going crazy or hallucinating, and you should not be. But, you know, the, unfortunately, there really is no way to stop it. It's just understanding what it is and not being afraid of it. I think Debbie wants to add a real quick comment on the end of that. I seem to be the resource person. That's good. But, uh, how many of you have computers or access to computers? Okay, there's an excellent website called visionaware.org. They did a four-part series on Charles Bonetti. So you can find some extensive information, and it's written in layman's terms. It's not written in medical ease. It's written so that any one of us can understand it. So www.visionaware.org. That is also a site that talks about many other things related. We, we also have it on, uh, information on our website under our frequently asked questions. So you can, there's, you know, there's more sources than us, but uh, that sounds like a good one because they did a, a series on it. So, all right, uh, who else over here has been waiting then? Here, okay. I believe this question would be directed toward the young lady, Ms. Cooper. It's been mentioned numerous times throughout the session this morning, eat fish. Now, are we talking a can of tuna versus fresh salmon? Are we talking a northern fish like mackerel or blue fish versus trout or uh, flounder? Basic question is, where do you get the most bang for the buck? Um, <laughs> no, you staged that question beautifully because it's actually the higher fatty fish that are the ones that are more effective with the omega-3 fatty acids. And you had mentioned things like salmon or tuna or herring or mackerel or bluefish. You know, those are all good good sources of the omega-3 fatty acids. So when it's canned, it doesn't lose any of the properties versus fresh. Well, I think whenever you can get something fresh versus canned, you know, even when it comes to vegetables, you know, it's, it's a it's a fresher product, and there aren't any other additives, sodium, etc. You know, you know, with it. Okay, good. Uh, I think we have someone over here on the end, Ron. Thanks. We've got three minutes. My name is Dan Kostelnik, and uh, this will be directed to Dr. Feynman. Uh, as, as far as the shots are concerned in the eye, I have had wet uh, macular, and my doctor has stopped giving me those shots, saying that it has stopped the bleeding. Is that a possibility, and is it true? Yes, it is a possibility, and it, I hope it's true. Um, so when the, all of the injections were studied, the clinical trials looked at two years of monthly injections as the standard of care. And in real life, most physicians, most retina specialists, do what's called a treat and extend, where you treat and you base your decision to treat on the scan, the OCT scan that I showed you. Your end point is getting rid of the leakage. So if it's been two years, and if it no longer is leaking, the injections may not be of benefit anymore, and you still need to be followed at least every three months to make sure it doesn't start leaking again. But the answer is yes, there is an end point, and you may have reached your maximum level of improvement and additional shots of the medication wouldn't do any further. Okay, that was that was the question whether it would start up again. Yeah. It might, and I'd say uh, you know maybe 20% of my patients end up years later, but many of them do very well without further injections, and I prefer to do it that way because you obviously anybody who has had an injection knows if you can avoid it, it's better not to have it. Okay, thank you. All right, I think I have some good news for everyone. So apparently there's an extremely long line of young students out the door, which is going to make a barricade for all of us to get out of here if we get out of here at the same time. So they're moving along. So the good news is we, at the risk of keeping you here a little longer, and I hope that doesn't keep you from your things you need to be doing, we could stay a few more minutes and let those students get out of the way. What do you think? All right, I vote for that, too. All right, good. We did not plan that, by the way. That was random. 
All right, good answer, Dr. Feynman. Who else? This lady's been raising her hand up the All right, you're so patient. Thank you. Hello, my name is Byrne, B-Y-R-N-E, Turk, and I, I'm afraid my question's for Dr. Feynman also. <laughs> I've heard you speak of vitamins. I, my uh, doctor, Kazahaya, recommended Octavite. Now, it's advertised frequently, and I've been taking it. I'm wondering if I'm wasting my time and money because of, uh, and I'm not familiar with the vitamins you mentioned. A two-part question. My side on had that wet macular in both eyes, went through the injections, and I'm on maintenance at this point. My next appointment is three months. But I'm also developing cataract. And he said they won't do anything with the cataract until I have more difficulty. Is there a danger with the cataract, sir? Or I gather there is, or you wouldn't say it. Okay, so there's two questions that you've asked. So we'll, let's talk about cataracts first. Cataracts simply mean a clouding of the lens as you get older. And um, Dr. Silvetti mentioned before, one of the main things he asked for is that you continue to see your regular ophthalmologist or optometrist because of this very reason. Cataracts can impact the ability to see. And also, cataract surgery itself is a procedure and it's associated with inflammation in the healing process. And one of the risks with doing cataract surgery is you may have had stable macular degeneration for many years, and right around the time of the cataract surgery, you can stir things up. And so it's very important if you're going to have cataract surgery that you sort of sign off with your retinal specialist as well and have him or her involved with following. I, I have that question asked by a lot of patients. And just to pretty much restate what Dr. Feynman had said, what I tell them is my understanding with somebody with macular degeneration and a cataract, the doctor won't recommend cataract surgery until the advantage outweighs the risk. And a lot of times, if you have the cataract out, you still have a loss of vision from the macular degeneration and you won't get much improvement. That's why they like to wait until it's more of an advanced cataract, because then they can determine what type of improvement is likely. Thank you. That was the first question. Yeah, so the second question is a maybe a little different. I'm not sure I can answer this. Everything I mentioned today, the vitamins, the ARITS 2, you had to have dry in either both eyes or one eye. So if you have wet in both eyes, technically speaking, there's no data to support the use of the ARIDS 2 vitamins any longer. Okay? Now, so what you're get, getting advice on is whether or not somebody your age with your dietary, with your diet, should be taking a multivitamin. Because that's what Occuvite is. It's basically a multivitamin with some enhanced ingredients in the vitamin. So I will defer to our... Good teamwork. I think that um, if, if it is not indicated, then going with a more basic multivitamin, multimineral type of supplement, like centric silver or something, is, is probably the way to go. You just need to be cautious when it comes to certain um, vitamins that are given and many times um, beyond what the recommended dose is because there can be some issues that arise because of that. And some of some of these vitamins it could be hundreds of times what the recommended da daily, you know, requirements are. So um, that basically would be my advice that if the vitamin is not indicated for treatment of the disease to go with a more standard type of vitamin and enhance the nutrients in your diet and then approach it in that way. Great. We have time for two more quick questions. Anyone else? Oh, good. Um, my mom started to get macular degeneration um, close to 80 years. Is that hereditary? And I guess I'm trying to find out if you already have eyesight problems. Are you a better candidate for getting macular as you age? 
that's an interesting one. Dr. Feynman, do you want to take this? <laughs> So, as we saw on, on the genetic slides, if you have a first degree relative, okay, a parent with macular, your risk is very high. Or, I shouldn't say very high, it's much higher than the general population. Um, and the thing about macular degeneration is, there's, this process is going on for many years without any visible signs. The vision is the last thing to go. And Sometimes you'll come in for a visit and they'll see the beginning, the drusen, and you say, well, I can't believe that, I see fine. But, so the answer is yes, what you do in your younger years can influence that a lot. Having said that, the data only supports the use of the ARIDS-2 vitamins when you have intermediate to advanced disease. The original ARIDS study looked at the category 2 and didn't find a significant enough benefit. So, I would just follow the advice we've heard. Fruits and vegetables, you know, healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, no smoking, fruits and vegetables, and sardines, salmon, tuna, mackerel, herring, fatty fish, at least twice a week. Okay. Oh, sardines are a very good source of omega-3. There you yeah. go. And they have sodium-free if you need that. There's an example in a can, right? Okay, one more. Do we have this? Who's that? Last question. My name is Jason George. Um, I'm used to being an oddball. Like uh, I feel like a misfit in this room. I think a lot of beautiful people here, but I was diagnosed at the age of 44 with wet macular degeneration in my left eye and dry eye on my right. But my question is similar to the previous one. Um, from the slide that was shown earlier, that it's more common far-sighted cases, um, and what my question would be is, can myopic degeneration, severe myopic degeneration from birth, um, has left me with basically a refraction of like between minus 23 and minus 26. Has that, is it possible that that has made me more susceptible because of the stretching, because of the stretching of the eye, the stretching of the retina, has it made anything more susceptible? And I, uh, I would also have a question as to why research seems to be, any trials and research being done seems to be in age 70 plus. <laughs> like I was researching telescopic implants and stem cell, and it seems like they only want to try that in people that are age 70 plus. Is it a risk reward? Okay, I think we can get your try to cover it with the, the gist of it. Do you want to? So it's maybe you can describe the difference. Well, yeah, so first of all, as soon as you said your age, I said probably not macular degeneration. Then I looked at your glasses, and I could see from your glasses that you're very myopic or nearsighted. So you have what's called myopic degeneration, which is basically a younger person's variant. It is not age related, it has a different mechanism. You're correct. Your eyeball, when you're very myopic, is larger, and you can imagine that the same amount of retina is stretched thin over that area. Those weak spots provide an opportunity for those blood vessels to grow through that weakened area of the retina, just like I showed you with the drusen. Okay, it occurs in conditions in younger people called angioid streaks. There's a number of them. And then it happens for no reason at all. But anything that weakens the layer under the retina can allow those blood vessels to grow. And they act very similar to macular. So yes, you have a pre-existing uh, pre condition that predisposed you to the wet. We call it wet because it acts the same way. And the unfortunate answer to your other question is, is that, you know, all this aside, the treatment, pharmaceutical treatments in general, are a business. And if 200 people have the age-related macular and to one with the myopic degeneration, that's where the resources and the research dollars are going to go. But on the flip side, we use the same treatments that we get FDA approved. We use them off-label for people with myopic degeneration. So it's been a real benefit, but you're not going to see a trial, and you're probably going to have issues with insurance covering for these quote-unquote off-label but we have ways around that. We have 
pharmaceutical company programs that will allow us to get treatment without paying for it for off-label indications or samples. So we can help. And by the way, we get a lot of questions at MVRF uh, almost weekly. Front and either on the, via our email or on the website or you know through our 800 number of individuals who are, have you're saying that it's an orphan disease, right? That's the, that's I mean, orphan, orphan. yeah. So, um, but the, as he says, Dr. Feynman mentioned there is hope because there are connections between in the research. So, a couple last things. Uh, we do have very quickly. We're going to get you out of here. I understand that line is uh, lightening up. And uh, we do have, before we let the panelists go, and, and we have a raffle uh, that we are, so what you need to do is look in your, your packets, and somebody in this lucky audience has, in the, blue in the blue folder, somebody has a piece of paper that has Charlie on it. In the dark blue. The dark in the dark blue, blue folders. And if you don't know what it looked like. Oh, now we're asking you to dig in there again. Should be on the top. There's only one, we promise. You need. Yeah? They've got a picture of Charlie. There's a picture of Charlie. Is this one of the. No, that, I thought that was it. Also one. For what chair? The, Charlie, what's the product called? The product they're with? They're rattling off is a compact mini by Optelect, and the, we have them over on the table. It's an electronic device valued at $295. Now you're looking. <laughs> now all of a sudden you can see it. Picture taken with Charlie. All right, we have one more quick item, another raffle item. We already found the winner. Sorry, folks. You're just lucky, Joe. Sorry to keep you pillaging through your materials. All right, the last item is Charlie's book, signed copy, to raffle it off. Signed with the 2020 pen by Optelec. Well, you yeah, that's you have to keep with the All right, on. I have a question. Whoever answers this question gets his copy. All right, what hospital was I diagnosed at? I can't hear you that well. Yeah, no, no. All right, somebody who ever said Mass General gets a copy of All right. I have a question for here. Marcy Lynn. Marcy won the book. All right, Marcy. All right, now you just have to tell Charlie how to spell Marcy. your name. All right, some wrap up, wrap up things. First of all, I want to thank our incredible panel, right? Thank you, everyone. I also want to mention that we have Joe Bilson here over in the corner. If you want to stand up, Joe. Joe is the CEO of Will's Eye. You may recognize that name who joined us today. Thank you, Joe, for fitting us in. You do incredible work over there. We're good friends. Also, a couple of other things. I want to thank our sponsors, Genentech. Uh, all, this entire program is underwritten by sponsorship. None of the money that we raise for research goes into this program. It's all paid for by sponsors. Genentech, I want to thank McDonald's. Okay, I want to thank Optelec, the president of Optelec US, is in the corner over there of the red ties, Stefan Twerlbeck, and his incredible team. All right, John Pop from Sage Vision, working hard with us on behalf of Pennsylvanians. I want to thank my incredible team in the black and white, wherever you are, Nikki and Ned, Pat. I want to thank our volunteers from Hope Page, is a sister organization or company of ours. Thank you, volunteers. We couldn't go without you. Thank you again uh, to Sales University and the team here. Uh, thank you, Will Zaha. I mean, the Mid Atlantic. We've got the president, uh, CEO John Dummel, here in the audience. 
And of course, the Center for Low Vision, excuse me, Center for Vision Loss. I knew I was going to do that one of these days. Because without that phone call from Doug and from his wonderful Karen, who's in the back, we would not be. And we are so excited that we said yes. And we are really excited to meet all of you. And we hope, I hope, we hope that you did learn one or two things that you didn't know before you came in. Because that's what it's all about. Drive careful if you're driving. Have a wonderful, beautiful fall weekend. Go Eagles. What else do I have to say? Thanks again.